Hello there and welcome to Skoma Live episode two. If you're watching last week, well done. If you weren't, where were you? And you will know that because we're all in lockdown, we're all a little bit down about the fact that unfortunately we can't get out to Skoma Island this year. So we're bringing a little bit of Skoma Island to you. Now later on, we'll have a look at some of the wildlife. We'll be joining the wardens out there as well. But I'm not alone. No, no, no. I'm joined by the wonderful, the inimitable Lizzie Daly, who is, I have to say, braving the outside world. I've come inside because it's pouring down with rain. Well done, Lizzie. Thanks, Yellow. <laughs> to be honest, I'm starting to regret it as my umbrella slowly starts to fly away. There's rain coming in sideways, but I'm very stubborn and I refuse to go inside. <laughs> Good. Well done. Well, if I see you tumble away in the hurricane, I'll keep going, OK? We won't worry too much. <laughs> now, Last week, we put out a poll and we asked you, the viewers, what you would like to see in this week's episode. And overwhelmingly, you said puffins. I tried to get you to vote for slowworms, but you wouldn't listen. You voted for puffins. So this is a show packed full of puffins. And last week as well, I promised I'd try and dig out some old photographs of me on Skoma. I have got some dating back 35 odd years. I couldn't find those, but I did find some from, I think it's 2008, of me uh, with my two boys who were then aged about, let me work this up, about 10 and 7, something like that. They're now 19 and 22. So this is us out on Skomer Island. And the youngest one has always been into all kinds of reptiles. So he had to go and pick up slow worms. And they did love the visit. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing place. But Lizzie, I have to tell you, they kept asking me all the time, Dad, why can't we chase the rabbits? You know, at that age, that's all they wanted was to chase the rabbits. So I was saying, no, 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 there are puffing burrows everywhere. Don't chase the rabbit, boys. And they're no more sensible now than they were back then either. Oh, Yolo, I love that. I'm sure they'll be feeling suitably embarrassed or very proud of those photos going out to however many people. <laughs> um, but they're fantastic. And with that slow worm as well, that's brilliant. And you're totally right. Skoma, Skoma Island just comes alive. You know, you're just walking around. You see so much activity so i don't blame them wanting to kind of go and be curiously looking at everything uh, that's around them but i mean so many of you as well got in touch from last week's episode telling us some of your favorite memories some old wardens got in touch you sent us loads of questions so please do make sure you continue to send your questions in for the wardens who will be joining us later and use the hashtag scoma live um, and we've been having a really busy week and we've been chatting to the wardens and they've been sending us loads and loads of updates. Um, and we have some of those updates, actually. Yolo, they sent, they sent you a fantastic clip, haven't they, of some of your favourite kitty wakes. Yeah, they have. They, this is really nice. You know, we, we've the, the one pleasant thing about lockdown is that the weather up to now has been so good. We had four weeks of virtually unbroken sunshine. Uh, we've loved it. And of course, it's benefited the wildlife as well. And Kitty Wakes uh, uh, are back on the wick there. Unfortunately, Kitty Wakes, very small, delicate gull, one of the few seabirds in Wales that's not doing well. So the colony we see here is one of the most important ones in the whole of Wales. But fantastic little gulls, lovely things. Yeah, and that clip is magical, that place on the wick, and you can really see them all swirling. I was chatting to Nathan, the warden, and he was saying that often the, the bigger predators, the black backed gull we talked about last week's episode, can really stir them up. So them going around in that fantastic circle is incredible. And we've also been sent another clip, a big hit with you guys last week, was the predatory behaviour of that great black backed gull. Uh, there's another one, but this time you can really see the scales. Have a look at this clip. You can see how big these gulls can get compared to the smaller rabbit. And of course, they're not the only gulls on the island. There's the kitty rakes, but there's also the lesser black backed gulls as well who have been found to collect nest material. So they're being busy collecting nesting material as well as uh, some of the herring gulls as well. On the island, what you'll get is the lesser black backed gulls nesting more inland. Um, and then on the rocky outcrops, you get your great black backed gulls who tend to be nesting alone. And then your herring gulls kind of dotted mainly on the cliffs, sometimes inland, but um, a lot of activity from the gulls. Uh, no eggs yet from the lesser and the herring gulls yet, but I'm pretty sure the wardens are expecting them very soon. Yeah, it's it's the end of April now, so they, they should be on eggs any day, really. And I'll tell you what, what's funny, you know, we think about the wardens out there having an uh, 
idyllic life. We're all in lockdown and they've got no problems whatsoever. But here's Sylvia to explain a kind of unforeseen problem on the island because of this lockdown. Isn't that amazing? You know, you, you you just don't think about that at all. The lack of people, and bear in mind, I think they get up to about 300 people a day often. It's very busy there. That keeps that path clear. But now they're going to have to do some management work to cut back. There's bracken encroachment. I think I saw some ragwood starting to come through there as well. So they're going to have to manage that, either that or get some more puffins in to just walk the path all the time. <laughs> I love that idea, but it's strange. I mean, this must be the first time in years where this path has now started to overgrow. What a strange change. Um, and of course, the last update is the puffins. So they've been really busy building their burrows, cleaning them out. I've been following the live cams all week. They are so exciting. Uh, check this clip out. I, I saw this just two days ago, this tiny puffin trying to pull on this bit of grass, this really thick grass that's stuck in a burrow. And it's, it's quite comical. And you get a sense of how small these orcs are. They really try to pull it out. And um, he almost knocks himself over trying to pull this grass out. Um, and actually, that's not even his burrow. He then goes off and takes it into his own burrow. <laughs> so it's, it's lots of activity going on on the cameras there. And uh, definitely lots to look out for. Now, if you are just tuning in, do remember to turn on your live notifications to get to know these lives when they're going out, when we're telling you all about what's happening on SCOMA, or you can just follow the live cams. Um, but actually, we, we're we going to head over to Annette, who's been doing some fantastic research on SCOMA and has been for the past 10 years. So take a look at this. Hi, everyone. I'm Annette Faye, a seabird biologist and junior research fellow at the University of Oxford. I've been studying the puffins on SCOMA Island for 10 years. My research looks into the at sea behavior, in particular feeding trips around the colony and their overwinter migration. But today I'm going to talk about another discovery I made about puffins. In 2014, while I was doing my PhD on SCOMA and watching birds to recite coloring puffins for my migration studies, I saw a puffin sitting on the water just down the cliffs with a stick in its beak. The bird used the stick to scratch its back for a few seconds, then took off and I lost it from view. As far as I knew, no one had reported puffins doing this before, but at the time I didn't think very much about it, made a note in my notebook and forgot about it. Four years later, in 2018, I saw that behaviour happen again. This time I was in northern Iceland trying to find out why Icelandic puffin populations were declining. I'd installed camera traps near puffin burrows to find out how frequently the birds came to feed their chick. One of my cameras by chance recorded a puffin picking up a stick and scratching its chest with it briefly. Unfortunately, the camera then stopped, so we don't know whether this happened once or multiple times. So why were these birds using a stick when they have a beak to scratch? We're not sure, but perhaps they were using the stick for its mechanical properties. Perhaps it allowed them to get a better scratch or to dislodge a tick more easily. I sent the footage to my colleague, Professor Dora Biro, an expert on tooth use in chimpanzees. When she saw the video, she got very excited and we realized we had made a nice discovery. And that's because scratching with a stick can be classified as tool use behavior. Tool use is when one uses an object in a controlled way with a specific goal and target. We humans use tools all the time, but it's very rare in animals, with less than 1% of all species known to do it. The animals which are experts at it are chimpanzees and crows, usually species which we think of as intelligent. Our observations are therefore interesting for three main reasons. First, this was the first time the stick scratching was seen as a wild bird, so this shows that the ways birds can use tools might be wider than previously thought. Second, most observations of tool use in birds are in the order called passerines. Puffins aren't passerines, so observations show that tool use in birds may be more widespread than we thought, including outside of the passerine order. And finally, our observations raise the questions of whether we might have underestimated the cognitive skills of puffins, and perhaps of seabirds generally, because usually species which can use tools have high cognition. Puffins and other seabirds have to solve many challenges in their everyday lives that require flexibility in behavior, learning, memory, and planning. And so perhaps we have been underestimating what they're capable of. 
These are only two observations, so we cannot make generalizations about it, but our findings raise interesting questions and hopefully will prompt more research into these. So we're all locked at home now, but when it becomes safe to go out again, and if you find yourself on Skomer or on another puffin colony and you witness a puffin scratching with a stick, please photograph or film it and let me know. Thank you very much. How amazing is that, Lizzie? You know, Incredible. it's absolutely stunning. And we, we've always thought exactly what Annette said there, you know, that it's only the most intelligent animals, of course, the, the apes, of course, the, the crows as well, maybe the odd parrot. But we can add puffin onto that list. And, and puffins, I think the reason why everybody loves them is because of that beak. It's an amazing, amazing beak. And, and, and that beak is a little bit like a Swiss army knife in that, you know, he'll use it to um, attract a mate and with a nose like I've got, I reckon I'd make a pretty good <laughs> puffin. Look at that. But puffins will just stand around and do this, turn their heads as if to say, look at that, look at that, BK, what do you think of that? They use it to, to, to patch up the burrow, you know, even to dig out a new one. They use it, of course, to catch fish. So it really is, as I say, it's a, it's a Swiss army knife, an amazing, amazing tool. Absolutely. It's definitely one of the most defining characteristics of a puffin. Um, and a lot of people don't actually realise that outside of that breeding season, they don't have that that amazing colourful bill. Um, it's that sheath is called it's called a sheath. It kind of sits on top of their normal bill, which is actually quite dull outside of the breeding season. Um, and it kind of molts at the end. And it's it's an incredible bill, but actually there's something really exciting that's come out of looking at that bill and we've finding out new things all the time and net tool use incredible in 2018 it was found by a scientist and ornithologist great ornithologist called jamie dunning who was looking at these bills under uv light he actually found that they glow under uv light so have a look at this picture it is absolutely incredible now if you think about a bird's vision compared to our vision we have something that's called trichromatic vision so we see in blue green and red wavelengths of light and birds have something called tetrachromatic vision which means they see in blue green and red but also in shorter wavelengths so in uv now these puffins aren't necessarily seeing that bright yellowy green light and scientists are still trying to figure out the actual function of having this kind of glow in their bill see my umbrella is dancing it's very <laughs> windy here in Cardiff um but they do think that actually the puffins it helps in making that contrast stand out in their bill so we still don't actually know the full function but still pretty pretty amazing I think you'll agree Yolo <laughs> Lizzie, it's all about sex. It's all going to do with sex. You know, they're trying to make themselves look as impressive as they possibly can. The bright colours, the UV light. It's all about males being at attractive to the opposite <laughs> sex, I think. That, that, that's, that's puffins for you. I told you we should have picked slow worms. We wouldn't have had any of this sex talk then. Look, <laughs> we asked that, you and you went for puffins, so that's what you get. <laughs> now, last week, of course, we were looking more at guillemots. Uh, another orc look a little bit like puffins less colorful in many ways and we saw them stacked in ranks of hundreds all along these narrow ledges where they lay but unfortunately what we didn't see last week were any eggs well we do have an update on that let's go back over to skoma so the brilliant news is that we had our first guillemot and first raisable egg only a few days ago on the island and it's always a great joy to see those because that basically means that the seabird breeding season is well underway. In the picture, you can see a female guillemot incubating the very first guillemot egg on Skomer in 2020 and the male standing directly behind her. In the video, another female landed next to them and the few males were trying to copulate with her, which meant that they were pushing into other territories and things got very intense pretty fast. There's quite a lot going on in that second video. We have the same pair of guillemots with their precious egg and the male is switching the incubation duty with the female very slowly and gently. What's interesting is that the female has a colouring on her left leg with a unique code Y089 
which tells us that she was ringed as an adult in 2011, so that means that she's at least 14 years old. You can also tell that she looks different compared to the other guillemots. It's a bridled guillemot, which looks as if it was wearing white spectacles. It's the same species, just a different type. To the left from them, there is an individual that still has some winter plumage feathers left on its head as well, which is quite cool. So we can follow individual pairs of guillemots and razor rills and watch the development of their eggs and see if they're successful in rearing chicks. And it's absolutely amazing to be able to do that. Yes! How good is that? I mean, we talked about that fantastic guillemot egg and how bright and beautiful it is just last week. And to get a bridal guillemot as well, that footage was absolutely incredible. To talk a little bit more about it, we actually have Nathan and Sylvia with us. Hello! Hello! I can't hear you. Hello! <laughs> Hello. 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 Can I Sorry. say... Oh. No, incredible footage. How exciting is that? So the first guillemot egg, I mean, how did that come about? Where did you find it? So it was found um, over on the Amos and it was during productivity monitoring. So at this stage, we're following guillemots to see if they're pairs and also to find any eggs. And then we'll follow them to see if the uh, chicks hatch and if they survive 15 days you want uh, until you assume that they'll become a jumpling that will survive. And um, that's how we do the productivity monitoring in a nutshell. Yeah, it's always, always an exciting event to see the very first one. In fact, we also had the razor bull egg on the same day in a sort of similar area. Yeah, very wow. exciting. Wow. Um, that, go on, Yolo. <laughs> no, all, all I was going to ask was, so you, you'll go out, are you out every day monitoring these birds? Or do you have once a week or once every two weeks or what? For guillemots and razor bills, it's more intensive, especially at this egg laying stage. So we will be out every day um, for monitoring their productivity. Other species, it can be a bit more spaced out. Um, so Fulma, for example, their chicks hang around for a long time and they are nice large chicks. So you just need to know that there's definitely a pair there that you're following. And then you can go back later and see, yep, yeah, they had a chick um, and it survived. Absolutely brilliant. Honestly, thank you so much. We have loved your updates from Skoma Island and congratulations, the first <laughs> guillemot egg and from a bridal guillemot. Definitely just have a little closer look if you can at photos of bridal guillemots. That lovely kind of white spectacle is just amazing. Um, now, some of you, I'm sure a lot of you watching will be aware of a sister island that sits right next to Skoma. It's called Skokum Island and uh, it's the quieter but also wilder and very special place, isn't it, Yolo? Have you been to Skokum many times, I'm sure? Yeah, yeah, I have. It, it all the attention is on Skoma, and I mean, <laughs> rightly so. It you, you know, it's such an amazing place. But but right next door, it's like a a, a quieter cousin, really, Skokum, and and I do like it there. It's got it's got a really good mix of wildlife and fewer people as well. So if you want to escape, that's that is often the place to go. And uh, we, we'll hear about it now from a lady who actually I know quite well has been around the seabird scene in South Wales for a long time, and that's Lisa Morgan. So I'm Lisa Morgan. I'm the new head of Islands and Marine for the Wildlife Trust South and West Wales. I've been in my new role for about three weeks and it's been a very interesting three weeks, let's just put it that way. Very challenging at the moment for everybody, um, but we're all getting by and we're all uh, doing our jobs and doing the best we can from where we can. Um, so, um, yeah, my history is all islands. So my first ever job in conservation just after university was on Skokum. Um, and I did three months as an assistant warden and I never looked back. It changed my life. It changed my career. It changed where I live. I now live in Pembrokeshire, as I mentioned. Um, and my entire career has been island based. I've been so lucky to work on some amazing islands all in Pembrokeshire but all important, all internationally and nationally important for their seabirds and their seal populations. So um, 
I've been hugely privileged and I really understand how important the islands are to us all. So I feel your pain now that we can't get you there. So this year, I obviously haven't been able to set foot on either Skomore or Skokum. Um, having said that, I have touched Skokum just briefly. So I was really lucky to go out um, to Skokum on the 16th of March when we took Richard and Giselle, our wardens, back to the islands. So when we came into South Haven, there were actually puffins on the water. So it was really nice to see our first puffins of the year. Just a few birds. But that evening, Richard and Giselle, after they unloaded and got their stuff up from the landing, um, did quickly get out and have a quick count. And there were already a thousand birds on the water um, around the island. So that was brilliant to see the birds back. And then by the following lunchtime, so that would be the 17th of March, birds made landfall, which was really early. It was the earliest ever recorded and I think it was a day or two earlier than last year so a really early landing um, and then the numbers have been building up during March and as we go into April as well um, some days there are thousands of birds on the water and on land as well other days nothing at all. We tried to bring you live footage of puffins from Skokum and Saturday night Richard and Zell went out to Crab Bay, perfect place for filming puffins on Skokum. 6.30 not a single puffin to be seen and the whole evening nothing came ashore and then the same thing happened again the following day. So there are no puffins to film so we didn't even have to worry about the dodgy internet connection, which we thought was going to be our main issue. Um, it turns out that the birds were just not there. And that's quite common early in the season. Um, Pre-egg laying, birds will come in and out and uh, their attendance is quite intermittent. So to be expected really, but um, unfortunately... Absolutely love that. And Skokum really is a phenomenal place. Um, now, I've been talking about it all week. I'm hoping you've been following it all week. The live cams. Um, we currently have the camera up on North Haven on Skoma. Typical. Typical. Nothing is there. And we've had puffins coming and going for the past hour. We hoped that one would pop out of its burrow, but no luck. However, if you were to follow this and be catching it maybe earlier in the mornings or later in the day you may see busy scenes like this one where puffins will be coming in coming out preening um there'll be bill clapping there's lots of interesting stuff that you can actually see on these live cams for me a massive highlight has been tuning in at night time and checking out the sheer waters you get a glimpse of such an incredible bird and from these clips you can see when they are so kind of clumsy on land with those legs really far back on their bodies they're really not very good on land and you can kind of get an up close view of them it's just absolutely fantastic so do tune in to those live cameras and make sure you share it with us as well yeah fantastic birds lizzie but my favorite because i've been watching them as well i picked this one it's a puffin doing a bit of maintenance work in its burrow comes out with this great big rock in its beak walks over and i always Reminds me of if, if ever you go to a gym, and I don't like gyms, I have to be honest, but if you go to a gym, there's always someone trying to make himself look big and strong, carrying a bigger weight than everyone else. And that's exactly what this puffin is. He's even got his chest puffed out. Look at him. Fantastic. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, showing off, I think, uh, Yolo, definitely. Um, right, we're slowly running out of time, so let's head back to the wardens to see if we can get some um, some of those questions answered. Loads of lovely responses. I'll just read a few out, a few hellos. Susan sends greetings from the Black Forest. She loves visiting Skoma. Gareth did a high-speed rib boat trip around Skoma in 2016. He says it was the best trip ever. Don't blame me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Derek Evans from Stafford says hi. Sasha says hello from Basingstoke. Hi from John Lewis and the Gower. Oh, fantastic. Okay, we have a question here from Ian who asked, is the wildlife on Skoma behaving differently with no tourists around? What a great question. Yeah, it is. Um, 
It's probably too soon to tell, to be fair. Um, we haven't really noticed any differences apart from paths overgrowing, uh, but with with wildlife, with the seabirds, we think, if anything, puffins are potentially hiding a little bit more in their burrows, because when we have the people at the wick, especially, you'll see you'll see them out uh, and about a lot, and that's keeping the gulls away um, to some extent, but um, not really, I think. <laughs> I think that's the, the beauty of SCOMA, really, is you do feel like you're in a really wild place, because as you walk around, everything just carries on without you. You know, you could be there, you couldn't. There's no difference, really. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, no, another great question from Norma Hines, uh, who asked, have the little owls left the island? She didn't see any last year. They have. Um, so they last bred over three years ago now, um, and there's not been any seen for two years. So that's good for the storm petrels, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but they, they are over on Skokholm, aren't they? No, no. Oh, as far as we know, well. they don't have them. Hmm. Ramsey. Oh, Ramsey, right. yeah. Ramsey, there we are. Okay, I'm going to keep going through. There's so many questions here. Uh, a good one, a puffin related question from Gareth. Why are puffin colonies on Skoma doing so well? And we haven't touched on that yet. So maybe you can go into to why that is the case. Yeah, good. Um, excellent question. Uh, quite a complex one. Um, mm -hmm. So comparatively, the sand eels and also um, a local um, fish called sprat is doing quite well and therefore to be important species of fish for puffins and also guillemots and razorbills as well. There's also protection of the waters around Skoma as well. Um, so they're the main reasons really. And it, it's worth coming in there Lizzie and seeing that Skoma really does buck the, the trend because it's, especially the further north you go in the UK up to Scandinavia up to Iceland you know, they're doing really badly. I remember about 10 years ago going to Iceland with a Danish ornithologist. He showed me a, a, a puffin colony that used to number nearly 2 million. And we reckon there were about 2,000 left, you know. So they, they, they're they really doing badly for a combination of reasons. Overfishing of sand eels, a warming sea as well. We think all this is affecting them. So it, it's brilliant that Skoma's seabirds on the whole are, are, are actually bucking that trend. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Another reason why you should really go out next year and, and celebrate, or hopefully later this year, we don't really know, but really make the most of this fantastic um, place. There's, I think we've got time for one more comment. I want to read it out because it's fantastic. Keith says he's loved puffins ever since he heard Ronald Lockley uh, give a lecture about them at his local Natural History Society when he was a sixth form pupil. And we all know who Ronald Lockley is, don't we? <laughs> yeah, he was a very well-known... Uh scientists, uh, ornithologist, author, who worked out on the islands for, for many, many years, way back, I think, went out there first, was it the 1930s, 1940s, a long, long time ago, and he lived, lived to be nearly 100, I think, he died over in New Zealand just a few years ago, he was a great man. Absolutely, I've actually got his book, which is fantastic, um, but yeah, thank you all so much for your comments and your questions, wardens, please continue to update us on what's going on, we've actually absolutely loved it and we'll be tuning in again with you next week i'm sure so thanks again everyone yeah um, thank you both <laughs> see you later and i think that's pretty much all we've got time for today a massive thank you for tuning in again we'll be back next week yolo i think we're in for a treat next week we've got short-eared owls oh do, do you know when, when i go to school and i know it's famous for its seabirds that's one of the birds i look forward to i'm a one year they had i think up to 12 nests on their 12 pairs which is more than double the welsh population on one small island so yeah i'm looking forward to next week definitely and just a little reminder everyone that we love scoma you love scoma but this is all really in partnership uh, as well with not just the team there but with the wildlife trust of south and west wales so you'll see in the banner a link where you can go and support their work support the wardens and all the fantastic conservation work that they're doing and hopefully 
we will see you next week. YOLO, I told you last week, I'll tell you again, bring cake next yeah, time. Yeah, listen, I have to apologise. No cake. My wife did make flapjacks, homemade oh, ones. They were so geez. nice. I ate them over the weekend. So uh, I, I will. Come I'll on. make real effort next week. Look, <laughs> I put on about eight stones since lockdown began, <laughs> so I've got to give up the cake. I've got to be... But thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much. See you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.